My next speaker, we refer to as the big friendly giant. Please don't be afraid. He is large and in charge, not just of himself, but of the entire Mind the Product community, which is the largest product community in the world. World Product Day, which was last week, Wednesday, was celebrated in 91 cities. 91 cities celebrated uh, what we do today, what we take for granted every day um, and gather together. That community of several tens of thousands of people, how many members do you have now? Estimate 150,000 product people and getting larger by the day was the brainchild of Martin Erickson. He was also the co-author of Product Leadership, which was the book that we released last year with Nate Walkinshaw. And now he has taken on the role of uh, essentially an entrepreneur in residence, but more like a uh, um, mentor, guide, and general direction giver to the portfolio companies at uh, EQ EQT, which is um, one of the largest funds in the world and certainly one of the largest funds in Europe. Um, and their portfolio companies, under his guidance, are going to do way better this year. So I'd like to <clears throat> welcome my friend and the big friendly giant, Martin Erickson, to the stage, please. London calling to the faraway towns. Now war is declared and battle come down. London calling to the So thank you for that introduction. While well, somebody hopefully runs me a remote for these slides, uh, I'm here to talk about how software is eating the world, and we seem to have lost the remote. This is not helpful when you're doing a slide presentation. So you would have been seeing a slide that said, software is eating the world, and you all know that quote. It was Mark Andreessen in 2011. Uh, but it's really important, I think, for us to take a step back and really think about how much has happened since then, and how correct he was when he made that statement. Back then, you'd be seeing lots of slides for this. Back then, Uber was a simple black car service in San Francisco. And today, it's worth over $50 billion. It's the world's largest taxi company, and they own, uh, and they own no cars. Airbnb was just a simple sharing tool to share your blown up bed back home. Today, it's the world's largest hotel. It's worth north of $40 billion. And again, owns no hotels, owns no buildings. Alibaba has, was just taking off back then. It's growing ridiculously quickly. It's now worth over $480 billion. It's probably over 500 by the time I hadn't updated the slides. It's the world's largest retailer, and yet has no stores, no inventory. So clearly, something has changed. And it's not just the kind of startups and the unicorns. Back then, the S&P 500 was dominated by companies like ExxonMobil, Chevron, and Walmart. Today, it's all technology companies. And you can argue they're all driven by software. So software is definitely eating the world, but it's important to realize that that's not done yet. In fact, Mark has updated his quote last year to software is programming the world. And it's speeding up. This transformation is bringing up new startups, new transformative technologies every single day. Some of them just capture our imagination for a short time but others disrupt and change how we do everything. So not only is software eating the world, it's moving faster and faster and faster. In fact, the rate of change today is the slowest you will ever experience. So my name is Martin Erickson, as Richard said, and I've been a small part of that change as a product manager for over 20 years. In fact, I started building stuff online when the internet still came on floppies. I can also claim to have beaten Snapchat, Periscope, and Facebook Live to the punch by over 20 years 
by hosting the first online live stream in Europe. Of course, it did take five engineers from the local telco, a giant satellite truck, just to make the thing run. The video quality was so terrible, I don't even have anything to show you. <laughs> and since it was a student orchestra festival, I'm not entirely sure the sound was much better. But it worked. I also co-founded Product Tank and then Mind the Product, which together are the world's largest community for product managers, with local meetups in over 150 cities around the world, including right here in Boston. In the last few years, I was working with these two jokers, Richard, you recognize, Nate is the other one, writing this book on product leadership, where we went around and interviewed hundreds of product leaders from all over the world about what it meant to be a leader in products and design. This photo is taken at one of our writer retreats in California. Being an author, it's really, really hard work. And then lately, I've been working as an executive in residence at EQT, helping all those portfolio companies. And really, I do all these things because I'm fascinated by how we keep up with that pace of change. And I'm fascinated about how we build better products. And to do that, I think we have to look at what it means when we say that software is eating the world. It means that the interface, our interface, to the world around us is changing. And I'm not talking about UI. It's worth seeing what Mark himself said. All the technology required to transform industries through software finally works and can be widely delivered at global scale. This is a really fundamental shift that I think we forget about a lot in our day-to-day -day work. New interaction models keep popping up. How we interact with technology is changing. They're trying to tear us away from our clunky old desktops. First came mobile, then wearables. Then all at once, it seems, augmented reality, virtual reality, voice, bots, and AI are trying to change how we use technology and how we interact with it. And as builders, this means technology is moving faster and faster and faster, and it requires more and more specialized skills. It also means much of what we interact with and how we build software today is abstracted away into services in their own right. How we interact with each other is also changing. Every day, it seems, a new paradigm for social interaction pops up from the heady old days of email, which was, I promise you, groundbreaking when it came, to chat tools, Snapchat, and video apps. Who here could have predicted how quickly Slack was going to dominate our working lives? But perhaps most significantly, we're also seeing the emergence of a lot of new business models. So how we interact with the businesses themselves is changing. Try to remember just how revolutionary software as a service was just 10 years ago. I launched one of the first recruitment software as a service platforms in Europe, and we didn't even call it that then. We were called application service providers. And in the past few years, we've also seen a ton more experimentation around this. We've seen the dominance of the App Store model, We've seen experimentation of subscription services, pricing models, downloadable content in games. Today, you can even subscribe to a Volvo or a Porsche or a few other car brands. You don't have to pay park, you don't have to, the only thing you have to pay is parking and gas, because the insurance, the servicing, the cost of the car, the loan, all that's included. And you can walk away with a month's notice. This is really fundamental shifts to how we work with these businesses. So this new interface surrounds us builds on a combination of insane advances in technology, new innovative business models, and a design and user experience discipline that is making technology more human-centric every single day. And that's, at the end of the day, why we're all here today. Because we are the ones that are building that new interface. But that's also why it's so damn hard. Because these new innovations intersect business, technology, and design. No one discipline can solve all the challenges that all three face. Whether we're product managers, founders, designers, data scientists, engineers, we are all product people, and that intersection is where we live. It's the middle of a Venn diagram. It's a slightly strange place to call home, but you know, 
we'll, we'll, we'll go with it. So I want you to ignore the semantics of job titles. I really don't care if you're a product manager, a product owner, a data scientist, an engineer, a designer, a user researcher. I don't want you to focus on the endless debate of who owns the interface, who owns the code, who owns the user, who cares. We are all product people and we all own that product together. Because none of us can do it alone. And that requires a new way of working. And that's really what I wanted to share with you guys today. Like any good heist movie, it starts with assembling your team. Now many of you may have seen this Venn diagram. I uh, am infamous slash famous for having written this in a blog post back in 2011 as my definition of what is a product manager. And define it as the intersection of the customer, the technology, and the business. And the challenge with this is twofold. One, some people tend to think I mean that product managers are the center of it all and we are more important than all of these other things. Not at all what I was saying. The other challenge is everyone thinks that means the team has to look like this. When really, of course, we all look like that, like that, or like that. And it's only when we come together as a team that we have all the skills necessary to really build great products. And there's probably a dozen more circles overlapping that, as we've seen in talks today, bringing in marketing and support and sales and customer success. All of these teams have their own unique insights. So it's important to think in a lot more detail about what skills you need in your team and to make it as diverse as possible and to really map out that diversity on every single possible scale. So whether it's work experience, knowledge, industry knowledge, creativity, culture, life experience, what are the things that are important to you and your organization and your team? And as you start mapping out your team, you can see where you have gaps that so you might want to fill and you might want to find complementary skill sets for. There's decades and decades and decades of research by organizational scientists, psychologists, sociologists, economists, demographers, that show that so socially diverse groups are more innovative than homogenous groups. Simply put, a group of people with diverse individual experiences are better than a homogenous group at solving complex, non-routine problems. And after all, that's what we do every single day. And it's really important because simply interacting with other individuals on your team who have different experiences make you more likely to find that empathy with your end customer that's so critical to our jobs. And if none of that appeals to you, I'll appeal to your bottom line. McKinsey has shown in the massive meta-study that they did with over a thousand companies over 15 plus years that the companies in the top quartile for diversity were a whopping 35% more likely to outperform their competition. At the end of the day, Product is a team sport. But as we all know, as soon as you have more than one team in an organization, we create friction. And this friction between teams is why we have libraries full of project management books, methodologies, inboxes, outboxes, dependency management, prioritization tools, and so much more. It's all because of friction. Because friction kills momentum. Friction kills speed. So it's important to think about truly cross-functional teams that can bring all those skills together into one cohesive unit. As we heard from Gil and a few other speakers today, it's only in that space where you can bring together a real understanding of the problem through customer research and empathy with an understanding of the solution space from your engineering and your design teams, but also your legal teams, your sales teams, your marketing teams. And that intersection is where we find opportunity for great products. It's also important to ensure that everything the team needs is in that team, because then there's no cause for friction. My favorite example of this is actually a startup in London called TransferWise. How many of you here have heard of TransferWise? Small handful. 
So TransferWise is a currency transfer platform. They're now a, a next-gen bank as well. But they started basically as if you need to move dollars to pounds. Uh, this is a peer-to-peer, -peer, cheap, fast way to do it. They've been growing phenomenally. They're valued north of two billion uh, pounds at the moment. And they t have taken this approach of truly cross-functional autonomous teams to the like final degree. The best example is a team called the Currencies Team. So this is a team that's responsible for figuring out what new currencies pass to launch. Okay, so dollars to pounds seems like a really interesting market. We should go after that. It's a big, big market. A lot of people moving money between those two. In any normal organization, that team would then have to go to the banking department and say, right, we need to open bank accounts in the US so we can do this. And the banking department would go, okay, it's in, it's in our backlog. We'll prioritize it when we're ready. Then they'd have to go to the legal team and ask for help rewriting contracts and rewriting terms and conditions. The legal team would go, yep, that sounds great. You're number six on the list. We'll get to it in a quarter. But what TransferWise have done is completely rethink that model. And so the currencies team doesn't just have a product manager, a designer, a couple of engineers. They have a full-time lawyer and a full-time banker in that team. So they never have to go outside that team to figure out how to open that bank account, what the cost versus uh, benefit of doing that is. They simply have it in the team. The team can execute their own goals. They can figure out not just what are the most important markets to go to, but what are the most effective ones to go to in terms of pain of opening those accounts. For example, in Malaysia, I think you still have to go in person to prove your ID. You can't do it online. So that was a lower priority for them. But the team could make that decision themselves. They didn't need anyone else to help them. I recently met an amazing data scientist at a conference not dissimilar to this that worked at a Fortune 50 company. And they proudly pronounced that they worked for the research and insight division of this company. Think about that for a moment. An entire division responsible for research and insights. On the one hand, that sounds amazing, right? There's this whole division. There's so many people, so many resources. We can do all this amazing ethnographic studies and, analy and analytics. We can do surveys and data collection. I'll make sure that my P number looks perfect. But on the other hand, think about the friction, the bureaucratic nightmare caused by having to go outside of your division, three divisions over, find the right resource to get something done. Imagine the request forms, the prioritization, the approval processes. Imagine having to make a business case for the research needed for your business case. So once we have these amazing cross-functional teams that have all the skills, we need to think about letting them create their own destiny. And it's important to empower them with autonomy. We're no longer working in the cotton mills, as evidenced by us being in one, what I presume was a cotton mill. So why are we using the management styles that came out of them? Command and control made a ton of sense when only a handful of top managers had any education, had the knowledge and the skills required, and labor was a literal human resource that needed to be corralled. And most of the agile and lean methodologies that we use today came from the Toyota production system. And they're fantastic if you've already designed a Toyota Prius and you need to build it as efficiently, cost-effectively, and error-free as possible. But what we forget in all of these debates and all these discussions and all these books around lean and agile is that the people who designed the Toyota Prius don't work that way. They can't work that way. We can't work that way. So we need to think about our own methodologies and empower our teams. Your team, at the end of the day, is smarter than you are. They're more informed than you are. They're closer to the problem than you are. They're closer to the customer than you are. So why are you telling them what to do? Instead, I really implore you to empower your teams and embrace autonomy, as we saw from Gill and other companies it's just an amazing way to let them use all of that knowledge, all that skill, all of that experience to get on with the job of solving the customer problem. Autonomy motivates better, as Dan Pink uncovered in his book Drive, The Surprising Truth About What Motivates Us, based on a ton of research out of MIT, showing that that old school carrot and stick model simply doesn't work if what you're trying to do is create innovative solutions. 
Autonomy scales better. You can simply spin up new teams around new products, new markets, new areas. And you never have to worry about what, it's, what the team's gonna work like when they're over 20, 30 people. It just doesn't need to be a problem. You spin out a new team, new focus area, they own that problem. And autonomy is fast. It removes all that friction. It removes all the layers of decision making between you and the customer and just lets them respond to both the market, the customer, and the trends much, much faster. Now, a lot of people hear autonomy and they think it means anarchy. Everyone can do whatever they want. They can come and go as they please. I'm not gonna have any control. We'll never ship anything. We can build whatever they want. But the key, really, to successful autonomy is autonomy with accountability. It only works when teams don't just feel ownership of the process and what they build, but they feel ownership over the customer outcome as well. Because then they will live or die by those outcomes. Leadership still has a huge role to play in setting the vision, the mission, and the goals that teams are tasked with executing, so that those autonomous teams have guardrails within which to operate. Leadership's biggest job here is to ensure alignment between the teams so that each one knows what their goals are, but also how they tie back to those company goals and those higher level vision and mission statements. To illustrate this, there's this really great chart um, drawn by Henrik Nieberg, who's the agile coach and organizational coach for Spotify, that maps out alignment versus autonomy. And if you start at the bottom with low alignment and low autonomy, you have a micromanaging organization where the boss is telling everyone exactly what to do, but it's a very indifferent culture. If you move up the alignment scale, your boss is telling you exactly how to get there, exactly what to do. It's a very authoritative organization, conformist culture. The boss is telling you what the problem is, but also what the solution is. If you instead move up that autonomy scale, but without alignment, you have your classic entrepreneurial organization with a chaotic culture and where you kind of hope someone's working on the problem. And like any good two by two, the consultants in the room know this, you need to be in the top right corner. <laughs> high alignment, high autonomy, which is where the boss is there to tell you what the goal is, but not how to get there. And that is how you build an innovative organization and a collaborative culture. True autonomy also means removing any dependencies and reliance on shared resources or shared teams. How many of you here have had a marketing team clamoring for change to their landing pages or anything else and you had to put it on the backlog? It doesn't make any sense, right? For a marketing team to be successful, for a growth team to be successful, they need to be able to build their own landing pages, but I also need to be able to follow that cohort all the way through your product. They need to be able to change the, the homepage. They need to be able to change the onboarding flow. They need to be able to make sure that the cohort is as effective as possible before they can even tell you whether a channel is profitable or not. So it's important to think about letting these teams have access to any part of the product at any time. True autonomy also means everybody in a team gets involved and brings their skills to bear to the process. Because only by co-creating can we bring all those skills and perspectives together. Marty Kagan, who's probably the godfather of modern product management, said, if you're only using your engineers to code, you're only getting half of their value. And I'd argue that this is true for all of us. If you're only using your designers to push pixels, you're only getting half of their value. If you're only using product managers to groom backlogs and write user stories, you're probably only getting half their value, and so on and so on. Get your engineers involved in design. Get your designers involved in engineering decisions and get everybody involved in customer research. Because insight, inspiration, and great product ideas can come from the least expected corners. I can remember what is probably one of my proudest moments as a product manager, which was about 10 years ago, I was working at a startup in London, building software as a service, collaboration software. We'd been experimenting with some of these new ways of working, we'd set up a few small semi-autonomous teams, and we kicked off a new project where I'd laid out kind of what the scope was, what the problem we were trying to solve was, some of the research that we had, and kind of that's when the magic started happening because I didn't write a single story for that release. I didn't come up with a single idea. I didn't sketch any of the, the work. 
the team did it all themselves. And the cornerstone feature that was kind of the building block for the entire thing and a whole new relaunch and a PR event and a big launch thing that we did came from one of the junior developers who piped up at the back of the room and went, oh, if that's what we're trying to do for the customer, why don't we do this? And they kind of unlocked this thing that got us 80% of the benefit for 20% of the effort in an instant, something I would never have been able to know because I didn't know the tech stack nearly as well as he did, even as a junior developer. Of course, it's not all bright sunshine and roses and champagne parades. Sometimes the team looked like this as well. Especially when you're giving that autonomy and you're giving the teams access to the whole code, you get a lot of clashes inside. Every team wants to touch the home page. Every team wants to change the customer dashboard. But by doing this, you're at least surfing those tensions internally. And that conflict of debate is better internally than pushed out to your customer. It's better to have that conflict internally than to shift the seams of your organization. So we've put together our amazing team. We've given them autonomy. The last piece for me is to make sure that those teams are co-located. The teams can be spread out everywhere, but the teams, ideally, should be co-located. And I know this is really hard for a lot of organizations, but I just find it so incredibly valuable. Because that high bandwidth communication that you can only get when you're sitting next to each other is critical to a successful team and is critical to the kind of communication you need for these teams to succeed. Even the world's probably most famous product designer knows this. Johnny Ive, who's probably in the middle of a big announcement at WWDC right now. Many assume that him and Steve Jobs before him kind of did all their design in an ivory tower with no input from anyone. They famously don't do any customer research. Everyone uses that as proof to like, oh, I shouldn't talk to my customers because Apple doesn't. We all know it's bullshit, frankly. But he knows how important the co-located thing is. Apple's new headquarters are an amazing, stunning piece of design. Slightly Bond villain-esque, but still stunning. And what really excites me about it is that like all good design, it's actually the physical embodiment of all of these principles and this new way of working. A huge reason for the design is simply to allow more interaction between different skill sets and to give teams really flexible workspaces where they can configure how they work themselves. Johnny Ive recently himself said that's one of the things that he's super excited about. At the moment, there are a number of really disconnected studios all over the world, or at least all over California, and now they can share one studio. You can have industrial designers sat next to a motion graphics expert, sat next to a color designer, sat next to somebody developing objects and soft materials, etc. I've worked remotely, I've worked co-located all over the world, and I can tell you that there's no replacement for that level of communication that you can have simply from sitting next to somebody for an hour. And that's why it's so important as product managers, founders, designers, that we design the spaces in which we work as well, because they design our process. It doesn't mean spending a fortune on it like Apple has, although if you have the money, why not? But it does mean being conscious about how your working environment impacts your working style. Has anybody here watched The Profit on CNBC? It's kind of a guilty pleasure of mine. It's a little reality show. Uh, it's about this guy called Marcus Limonis, who's a successful business guy. And he goes around the country helping small mom and pop businesses that are struggling. And he doesn't just invest some money like Shark Tank or anything else, but he actually goes in really deep for weeks or months to help kind of reboot the business. And almost every time, the first thing that he does in all of these businesses is to reorganize the physical space. Whether it's an office or a factory or an ice cream store or a key lime pie store in Florida, he reorganizes the space to optimize the flow and the working conditions and the interaction with the customer. And I find it fascinating that we recognize how important that is in those environments. It's obviously important in a factory. It's obviously important in a store or in a fast food outlet to be able to interact with your customer. But why do we never do that for ourselves when we work in design teams or software or digital tools? Sharing a physical space and being able to use physical artifacts really impacts how you set up your process. 
Zing in Germany is basically the LinkedIn of, of the German-speaking world. Have this fantastic concept called Auftragsklärung. And don't worry, no one has to pronounce it or spell it. No pop quizzes at the end of the talk. And it's basically a template for how they pitch, discuss, and monitor their product ideas. Loosely translated, it means mission clarity. Each team prepares this giant, I think it's an A1 poster, uh, for their pitch for resources. They maintain it as they learn new things and challenge their assumptions, post-it notes, writing on it. They also regularly present it to each other at team meetings or all hands. But most importantly for me is that they then post that physical artifact on the wall next to their team workstation. And so anybody walking past has a standardized format to see what each team is working on. And they can go, oh, you guys are working on that? Here's this really cool piece of information I just learned working on something else about our customer that might help you guys, or challenge an assumption, or ask a question. But that kind of conversation is hugely valuable. And the format of the canvas doesn't matter. It can be the lean canvas, business model canvas, something you design yourself. What matters is the physical interaction that this artifact allows. It can be a giant post-it wall in your conference room. It doesn't really matter. And you don't have to travel that far to see it in practice either. I think you actually saw this photo in Gil's presentation this morning. This is the team at Pluralsight. You can see all the physical artifacts, all the post-it notes, as a team kind of debating and co-creating and challenging assumptions and talking about what they've learned in their latest customer interviews. I know David Council and his team drift work that way. Spotify, Box, Intercom, so many more are starting to work this way as well. And as you walk through their offices, it's striking to me how little time you see people actually just behind their computer with their headphones on. They're either working in groups, they're in meeting rooms on calls with customers, they're standing around a whiteboard or a wall of post-it notes like this trying to figure out how to make sense of all the information they have, how to find the signal in the noise. So bringing it all together. That's great, I hear some of you saying, but how do you actually do this? I think as leaders, it's important to think about assembling your team in a diverse, cross-functional, co-located way, setting them up for success by thinking about psychological safety, autonomy, and purpose, and picking the right process that balances discovery and delivery. Because as managers, our job is to get out of the way. As team members, you can make this change happen. If you start small and you show, don't tell. Change how you work before you try to change your team or your organization and show the benefits of this kind of cross-functional working. Pull in other team members into your work. If you're a designer, pull an engineer into the discussion. If you're an engineer, pull a designer in. Because then they'll return the favor and you'll learn so much more about the challenges of building the product, what they have to go through to figure out what, how to get it done, but also to share the in various customer insights and experiences that you have. And finally, as much as you can impact this, make sure that you and your team's goals are all aligned with each other and with your customers. Because as team members, our job is to get in the way and to challenge the status quo and to break down those norms and figure out better ways to build products. Teams focus on customers. Leaders focus on culture. Because at the end of the day, we all own the product. And whatever the title is, we are all product people, we are all product managers, we all own this thing that we're building. And I'm missing a final slide here, but it is basically to say that software is eating the world, but it's important to remember that we are the ones who are writing the menu. And it's only by working together that we can figure out not just what's going to be tasty and a great experience for our customers, what's going to be you know, the right price, but also make sure that we're not poisoning our customers or burning down the kitchen in the process. So please go forth and work together. Thank you very much.